With his blonde hair, soft face, and a height barely above four feet, Joseph Hall looked like an average ten-year-old boy without a care in the world. But what if I told you that merely weeks after this photo was taken, he would go on to commit the unthinkable by murdering his father. Now, Joseph already carried a burden of social and behavioural issues, many of which were deeply rooted in a traumatic childhood inflicted by his abusive and extremist father. Sadly, the man's troubling tendencies continued to escalate over the years, and eventually, something within the young boy inevitably snapped. But things wouldn't end well for Joseph either, and some would even argue that the judicial system failed this child not just as a victim, but as a perpetrator too. So, was Joseph's reaction unwarranted, or was there an element of justification? Listen to this story, and I'll let you decide. Welcome, or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today I've got another dark story for you, and this one comes with a very debatable social dilemma. Today, we're looking at the complex case of Jeff Hall and his son, Joseph Hall. This story really did push the boundaries of the judicial system, and left many deeply frustrated. Before we begin, this is your gentle reminder that I serve nothing but coffee and dark stories. So, if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. And now, with that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Joseph Hall. Welcome back to the state of California, folks. A state well loved for its beaches, cities, and vibrant lifestyle. With the likes of Los Angeles, San Diego, and San Francisco here, it is no wonder that this state has become North America's most populated. In today's video, we are stepping outside of the sprawling metropolis of LA, and venturing east to the small city of Riverdale, which, of course, hangs on the edge of the Inland Empire. With a population of 300,000 residents, there is plenty to see and do here. I mean, for one, you can find the world's largest paper cup here, which is actually made of concrete. I have no idea why anyone would want to go and see that, but it is there if you'd like to. More notably, Riverside offers picturesque landscapes, a vibrant culture, and a rich history to all who enter. And being nestled between the Santa Ana River and Box Springs National Park, and just a stone's throw away from LA, it is certainly worth a visit. Now, unfortunately, Riverside does have a significantly high crime rate, placing it higher than 87% of all US cities. But this crime does tend to be localised into neighbourhoods, making some parts a little more comfortable for families. One thing this city does have, however, is a cyber security centre. The centre is designed to provide support for online security awareness to the local community. As you know, staying safe online is becoming more and more difficult in the modern age, so it's great to see this city have such a thing here. Even if you are internet savvy, it is easy to be fooled by online threats such as malware and malvertising. Sometimes, clicking a rogue advertisement may actually allow malware to be installed on your computer, allowing it to destroy or even steal your data. This can lead to information such as your banking details and social media passwords being stolen, which is absolutely not ideal. And that is why you should always consider using NordVPN, our sponsor for today's video. With NordVPN's threat protection service, you can block dangerous sites and limit advertising, giving you a cleaner, safer browsing experience. Malvertising can be extremely convincing, so avoid the temptation to click by blocking them altogether with NordVPN. And this is just one of Nord's many incredible features. With all of the browsing and research that I do online, it has protected me countless times from risky websites, keeping me and my information safe. And with thousands of servers all across the globe, it has helped me access geo-restricted content at the click of a button allowing me to enjoy the internet without borders. Take control of your internet experience today with NordVPN. Right now, those who use my link, nordvpn.com slash coffeehousecrime, will get the best deal currently available. That's a two-year plan at a huge discount, plus four additional months for free. What's more, it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash coffeehousecrime, or click the link in the description below. One of those families living in this sun-drenched city was the Hall family, consisting of 32-year-old Jeff Hall, his current partner Leticia Hall, and their two children, Joseph and his younger sister Shirley. Now, I wish I could openly tell you how good this family was, but unfortunately, it's all rather dark. Most of them were wrought with turbulence and extreme behaviour, so 
I guess we'll dive right in. To begin with, the children's mother, named Leticia, was riddled with destructive and dangerous habits, those including alcohol and drug abuse. To list a few, this included heroin, methamphetamine, and LSD. And sadly, all of these habits spanned well into her pregnancies, leading to developmental issues in both children. Leticia was not the only one with issues of substance abuse either. Jeff was an extremely heavy drinker, which often resulted in erratic and abusive behaviour. And sadly, he would take out his frustration on his partner and his two children. You could hardly say that the two were a match made in heaven, and eventually, probably through their destruction, of habits, the two split up forever, likely with a whole lot of arguing. The children would carry on to live with their mother while their father remained in the family household, but sadly, this would not be the end of their neglect and abuse. Leticia was not in any state of mind to look after her children, and after the neighbours made social services aware, they were astonished to see the conditions they were living in. The house had no gas or electricity, smelled absolutely awful, and was filthy throughout. It was so bad that bugs crawled everywhere, and in the kitchen, dishes piled up with maggots on the worktops. The children themselves were dirty and malnourished, and sadly, Joseph and Shirley were covered in bruises. This story was nothing short of tragic. Simply put, there is no excuse for a child to be living in such conditions, especially at such an impressionable age. The consequences on their mental health, right through to adulthood, could be absolutely enormous. No surprise, following a visit from social services, Leticia lost custody of her children. And although her children would usually be placed in the care of their father, he was currently on probation for driving under the influence of alcohol, meaning he too was also prohibited from looking after them. With this being the case, their next point of call would be their grandparents. And although they would take their grandchildren in, Joseph and Shirley still would not find a peaceful or stable household. In the meantime, while his children were clearly going through a turbulent and influential point in their lives, Jeff was off finding a new lover. He would eventually remarry to a woman named Krista McCarry, and fast forward five years, he was now a father to three more children. All three were daughters, by the way. Now, after finishing with his probation, Jeff filed for custody of his children, and having somewhat stable living conditions and having found a new partner, he was successful in getting them back. This meaning he was now back with his wife, his initial two children, and three more kids making a family of seven. Although Joseph's new sisters had a slightly better start to life, both he and his sister had endured a traumatizing and damaging start to their own, of course being filled with abuse, neglect, and drinking. And sadly, this abuse did not stop with their new larger family either. In fact, on further inspection, it would be found out that 23 different child protective reports had been filed at the new residence due to neglect reported by neighbours. Many of these reports highlighted Jeff's abusive behaviour towards his son, whom he would often kick and scream at if he didn't shut up, go away, or calm down. You may already see where this is going, but as often experienced in traumatic households, this history of abuse and neglect would eventually be reflected in Joseph's behaviour as well. He developed habits of hitting his older sister and mother, and liked to start fires in the backyard. And his very own grandmother would later go on to describe him as a violent and volatile child. I mean, what do you expect? He had a turbulent life at home, and his school life was no better either. You see, Joseph had been expelled from various schools, schools, which was extremely worrying for a child of only 10 years old. He was caught hitting other students and staff members on numerous occasions, and whenever he was told off for his behaviour, he appeared confused and did not seem to understand. Joseph was later diagnosed with ADHD, a condition that makes it more difficult for people to concentrate, with an increased likelihood of impulsivity. It was also noted that he had deficient intelligence for his age, likely because his mother was drinking alcohol and taking drugs while she was pregnant with him. The situation escalated when he was expelled from school for strangling his teacher with a phone cord. He furthermore didn't seem to understand cause and effect, and didn't seem to understand what consequences were. This final incident led Joseph to being homeschooled instead, because none of the local schools wanted him anymore, and the family couldn't afford to send him further away. As we know, he hit both his mother and stepmother quite frequently, 
but this did not stop him from calling Krista his mother. Now, by no means does this mean that she was the perfect parent either, by the way. Allegedly, Krista also drank quite frequently, and neglected her children for her own needs. Neither she nor Jeff regularly cleaned the house, and left their kids to roam free among the mess. So, we already know what Joseph's father was like. He was an abusive and a violent person. But do you think that any of that changed once he had all of his kids back with him? Even after welcoming three more children to his family, his terrible ways continued. Jeff was not kind outside of the household either. In fact, he was quite the extremist, to be blunt. As the leader of the local Socialist Party branch, which is the official name of the Nazi party, Jeff was a true white supremacist. His goal was to create an all-white community and segregate the races once again. And he was so passionate about his beliefs that he often said he would die for this cause. Spoiler alert, it may be a little closer than you think, Jeff. Although he was formerly an established plumber in the local area, he had recently lost his employment because of his beliefs and his lack of reliability. But of course, he blamed the economic downturn of the construction industry on all the Jews and non-whites. Jeff's views made him a very hateful man, and despite everything he had put his son through, he was still Joseph's role model. And sadly, of course, this would further influence the boy's violent behaviour. I mean, when you view it that straightforward, it suddenly makes sense why he would hit his sisters and mother in his tantrums. Now, Jeff was not quiet about his beliefs, even in front of his young family, and would even host rallies at his home in Riverside. As is expected of someone who is interested in Nazism, he was deeply interested in World War II, and passionately collected military weapons. In addition to this, he also taught Joseph how to use firearms and throwing knives. You know, the very typical sort of thing that you would teach your pre-adolescent son with deep anger issues. With all of this extremism in the household, Joseph stood no chance of becoming a happy and peaceful young man. He was surrounded by extensive hate speech and Nazi paraphernalia, and was even taken to rallies and protests fully dressed in Nazi uniform. They would talk of causing harm and even death to those unlike them, and would often take matters into their own hands. Joseph was highly xenophobic, even from a very young age, and was firmly against subjects like immigration. In an interview in November 2009, Jeff spoke about his party by saying, They are proud of who they are, tired of white guilt being shoved on their kids and multiculturalism. They can't see any reason for it. Now, although these gatherings at Jeff's home were not full-blown rallies, they were still heavily influential to the party's beliefs. Imagine a group of family friends coming together, playing party games, having a barbecue, and talking about the death of other people. It was all quite jarring, really. So, to sum things up here, we have a young boy who has been rehomed twice, has an abusive father, was expelled from multiple schools, has been spoon-fed extreme beliefs, and now knows how to use a firearm. If you ask me, I think we now have a perfect cocktail for a disaster. I mean, the poor boy hadn't even become a teenager yet. His brain was cooked with so much hate before it even had the chance to develop. Approaching the main event in today's story, it was on April the 30th, 2011, that Jeff held another soiree at his house. Nothing out of the ordinary happened here, as with most of these things, everything went by without fault. Now, Jeff didn't know this at the time, but this would be the last time he would ever host. In fact, this would be the last event he would ever attend, because soon, Jeff would be dead. On the evening of April the 30th, 2011, and after seeing all of their guests away, the whole family sat down to watch Yogi Bear in the living room. Although the party had finished and all guests had gone home, Jeff carried on through his whiskey bottle while watching the movie. The drunk father was in another one of his bad moods, as was usually the case while drinking. And although the room was quiet, with the rest of the family focusing on the movie, one comment made by Jeff stuck with his son, Joseph. In his drunken rage, Jeff taunted that, if they didn't listen to him, he would deactivate all of the home's smoke detectors and burn the house down while they slept. Following this horrific threat, Jeff eventually passed out on the sofa, and being the more responsible of the two, Krista put all the children to bed, as she had done many other nights before. After that, all went quiet in the family household, at least for now. But at 4.02am, Riverside Police Department received a very distressing phone call. 911 emergency, 
emergency. My son shot my husband. I need an ambulance. He's bleeding. <laughs> How old is your son? Oh, How old is your son? Ten. Oh, God. After hearing a gunshot ring out from the living room, Krista rushed out to the scene. Along the way, she passed her stepson Joseph, who appeared to be running to his bedroom. That is when she found Jeff's lifeless body. Police swiftly responded to the scene, discovering Jeff Hall sprawled on the sofa, drenched in blood and unresponsive. A gunshot wound behind his ear hinted at a calculated act by the assailant, and sadly, he was declared dead on sight. The state of the residence was absolutely absolutely deplorable, with scattered clothes and a pervasive stench of urine permeating the air. Amid this grim setting, Krista and her four daughters were evacuated from the premises, ensuring their safety. However, Jeff's son, the alleged perpetrator, was conspicuously absent from the group. A brief search of the property led to his discovery. He was found hiding beneath the covers of his bed. And after uncovering a revolver, which was found under his toys under the bed, investigators established a direct correlation between him and the firearm. The 10-year-old boy was promptly arrested before being escorted into the back of a police car. By his side was Officer Michael Foster, who was designated to help juveniles. While on his way down to the police station, Joseph clearly seemed agitated, and not long after arriving, he would eventually confess to the crime. But this confession took a rather unusual turn when his statements added a layer of complexity to the story. It became quite clear that Joseph did not fully understand his actions. This is supported by Officer Michael's statement, which said, he was quite sad about it. He wished he hadn't done it. He asked me things like, do people get more than one life? Things like that. Following this, Joseph was transported to Juvenile Hall, where he would remain in custody until his trial. Meanwhile, his four siblings would be placed under protective custody. Fortunately, Joseph's grandmother would intervene once again to ensure that they were spared from entering foster care. With Jeff dead, Krista McCary was charged with the criminal storage of firearms, as we know, both of them loved to collect weaponry, most of which were within easy reach of Joseph and the sisters. It was soon discovered that Jeff liked to keep a loaded revolver in a cupboard next to his bed. Three of the five children knew about this firearm, and furthermore, it was the one used to murder him. When Joseph entered Juvenile Hall, he was both the youngest and the smallest one there. In fact, he was so small and young compared to the rest they didn't have any shoes in his size. After going out to buy him shoes that fit, Joseph thanked the staff and then even asked them if he could take the shoes back home with him when he left, this further highlighting that he had no understanding of the situation. The boy remained largely emotionless in his initial interviews, only responding when being spoken to. He also responded to waiving his Miranda rights, which of course is the following. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say may be used against you in court. You have the right to talk to a lawyer and have your attorney present with you while you are being questioned. And if you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you. The great thing about Miranda rights is that they allow you to remain silent until you have a qualified lawyer and attorney. The problem is that officers asked these questions to a young boy who clearly did not understand what they were talking Talking about. In short, these officers were inviting him to speak without a lawyer present. This is wild, because how is a 10-year-old boy with learning difficulties supposed to even know what his Miranda rights are? In addition to this, they even allowed him to talk about the incident for two whole minutes before he was even offered them. Even stranger is that, due to his age, his stepmother was in the room while the interrogation took place. And despite being a supposedly fully grown adult, she was just as bloody clueless. All of this came as a significant detriment to Joseph. Children at this age rarely understand the implications or consequences of their actions, and, as we already know, he was unfortunately on the slower side of his age group too. Throughout the interrogation process, he told the officers exactly what they wanted to hear. Joseph confessed that he was angry and frightened after his father threatened to hurt his family, and that, furthermore, 
he thought that something had to be done. He also said that he didn't know any other way out of the situation, which scared him. According to the boy, he had recently watched a TV show called Criminal Minds, where he watched an abused boy of his age shoot his father in the face and get away without any consequences. And after watching this episode, he thought that maybe nothing would happen to him if he did the same. And so, on the night his father was passed out on the sofa, he crept to his parents' bedroom, silently grabbed the revolver from his cupboard, and shot his father in the side of the head. Joseph would later say, I just thought that maybe he might learn a lesson. I was trying to make him feel how I feel when I get hurt. Then maybe we could go back to being friends and all start over. Addressing Krista, he then followed up by saying, I think I'm gonna miss dad, kinda, if he's dead. So, the question is, did Joseph really understand right from wrong in this situation? Did he know that his actions would kill his father and that he could face legal consequences? Or was more at play here? Well, yes, Joseph did know what he was doing was wrong. We know this because he was influenced by the true crime show. He also made a rather naive attempt to hide himself and the gun after the crime, further indicating that he knew what he was doing was wrong. And this attack was apparently premeditated too, because four days before the murder, he told his sister that he wanted to kill his father so all the pain would stop. But of course, Joseph's very own confession was more compelling for investigators. And so, at the very young age of 10 years old, he was officially charged for his father's murder. And if convicted, he would face a sentence at the juvenile correctional facility, potentially being held there until the age of 25. Once again moving to the legal proceedings of this case, Joseph's trial commenced in 2013 when he was just 12 years old. His defense team opted for an insanity plea during the trial, citing factors such as his tumultuous upbringing, ADHD diagnosis, low intelligence, and behavioral issues as contributing elements. Joseph's grandmother candidly expressed that the boy had always been problematic and prone to violence. She emphasized the dangerous combination of these traits with his exposure to violent ideologies and firearms, again portraying a volatile situation that was merely waiting to unfold. Contrary to this narrative, in his own opening statement, prosecutor Michael Socchio asserted that the motive for the murder was not rooted in Jeff's ideologies. He further clarified that Joseph did not kill his father because of the latter's affiliation with Nazi beliefs. Instead, he contended that Joseph's actions were driven by a desire to protect his mother and sisters from potential abuse. He further said that Joseph would have shot his father even if he was a member of the Peace and Freedom Party. Now, at times, our ideologies can cloud our perception of undeniable facts, and in Joseph's case, he is unequivocally a murderer. And while some may hail him as a hero for eliminating a white supremacist, the true motive behind the act was not rooted in an anti-supremacist stance. Described as a sympathetic killer, Joseph's case elicited understanding and even pity from many. This included the judge, Michael Socchio, who had never presided over a child, especially for a murder charge. During his trial, Joseph remained remarkably still and silent, likely following instructions. The first emotional hint of him grasping the gravity of his actions would surface when the 911 call from his stepmother was played in the courtroom, prompting a visible change in his demeanour as he dropped his shoulders and looked down solemnly. Joseph's confession, attitude and admission of guilt, along with his acknowledgement of right from wrong during interrogations, played a pivotal role in determining his final sentence. In the year 2013, and at the age of 13, Joseph received a sentence to a juvenile detention center until he turns 23, that being just two years shy of the maximum possible sentence. Now, Jeff Hall's terrible character, evident not only in his beliefs, but also in his treatment of his family, might lend some sort of understanding to Joseph's actions. The ten-year-old boy, who was arguably feeble-minded and mentally ill, was provided with both motive and means to inflict harm, ironically turning them against the very person who taught him these things. While Joseph was only ten years old at the time, the deliberate act of taking another person's life qualifies him as a murderer, regardless of his age, and for that 
that, there must be some sort of punishment behind his behaviour. The question is, if he had not been 10 at the time, would he have still committed the act later? Well, according to his grandmother, and expressed in a 60 Minutes interview, such a possibility is not far-fetched. And this raises further unsettling questions about the factors that shaped Joseph's disturbing path. In this interview, she said, I wasn't surprised by it. I just somehow felt that it could always happen, but I would have thought that it would have been when he was older. Now, technically, Joseph should be a free man today, but with no news of his release, there are only two possible options. Either one, he is still behind bars, or two, he has already been released but with a new identity. We can only hope that juvenile detention has served this man well, and if there are any updates in the future, I will be sure to let you know. Now, this story has quite a hard question behind it. Do you think that Joseph Hall received the correct sentence? Many believe that Joseph was merely acting out as a victim against the abuse that his father set upon him, and that he was too young, naive, and unintelligent to understand what he was doing. But on the other hand, he did murder another person, and many believe that he should face legal consequence. It's a hard one to wrap your head around, really. Many believe that if you kill somebody while defending yourself, you should not face legal consequence. And although Joseph was not in immediate danger at the time of killing his father, it was very clear that he did pose a risk to his safety. Anyway folks, I'll leave you to come to your own conclusion. So, as always, please let me know what you think in the comments down below. And yeah, I think that pretty much ends our case today, folks. Thank you so much for watching today, I really do appreciate you being here. If you'd like to support me and my channel, then please check out my Patreon, it really does help me out. Alternatively, you can buy my coffee classified at classifiedcoffeeco.com. And another option, if you'd like to get involved with the Coffee House crime community, then please check out my social media, most notably my Instagram. We have so many cool things coming up. Anyway, folks, that is it today. Thank you again for watching, and as always, I'll see you again very soon for another video. Until that moment arrives, though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe. Thank you, and goodbye.